Hi, <laughs> I'm Beth Charles and I'm a first year fiction student here in the MFA program. Allegra Hyde is a native of rural New Hampshire, but since then has made her home in such far-flung parts of the world as Singapore, Bulgaria, New Zealand, and elsewhere. She received her BA from Williams College and her MFA from Arizona State University in 2015, where she served as an editor for Hayden's Ferry Review. Her writing has appeared in numerous publications, including New England Review, Gettysburg Review, The Missouri Review, The Three Penny Review, and elsewhere. She is a recipient of a Pushcart Prize, as well as fellowships and grants from the Virginia G. Piper Center for Creative Writing, the Gentile Artist Residency Program, the Lucas Artist Residency Program, the Elizabeth George Foundation, and the U.S. Fulbright Commission. Her first book, Of This New World, won the 2016 John Simmons Short Fiction Award and was described by Judge Bennett Sims as smart, stylish, and surprising. Describing this book, author Tara Eisen said, these extraordinary stories illuminate our hunger for utopias, both earthly and transcendent, and the sometimes dangerous lure of love. Hyde writes with a genius scientist's impassioned inquiry and a poet's lyrical, exquisite precision. I was first introduced to Allegra's work when I was researching the MFA program here, and I am so proud and humbled to be in a program that produced a writer of Allegra's caliber. I look forward to reading everything she writes in the future, and after tonight, I think you will too. It is my great pleasure to introduce Allegra Hyde. Thanks so much for that introduction. Blushing. Um, there's so many thank yous uh, that I want to uh, express. Um, thank you, first of all, for coming. Thank you to the English Department and the Piper Center um, for helping bring me here. Um, I'm just so grateful uh, to be part of this writing community, grateful to have, the, uh, to have had the support of this community during my MFA and even more so um, post-MFA uh, in the years since. Um, yeah, you're an incredible group of people, and I'm really honored to be reading here tonight. I'm going to read the beginning of one of the short stories in my collection um, called Ephemera, and then I'm going to read the entirety of a really tiny story to finish um, the evening. They're both desert-themed uh, to celebrate this um, uh, desert incubator that we're in. <laughs> this is ephemera. It's Tuesday. Vera hits another cowboy town. She wears each day in a stratum of red desert dust. The only stuff that sticks. Two weeks ago, she noticed the hole in her pack, noticed her belongings leaking like prizes from a battered pinata. Last time she checked, she only had eight disguises, three band-aids, and a dried-out scorpion. The $423 delicately lifted from Dale's stash now mark a trail down Interstate 8 back to Tucson. Easy come, easy go, Vera tells herself, ducking through the jingle-lingle of another diner door, inhaling greasy, griddled steam. But it's not easy, and she knows it. When mornings yawn, pinked and innocent, Vera gets a gut punch of guilt. It's the only thing she feels besides hunger now and then. And when Vera gets hungry, she finds a 24-hour diner and a lonely man. The men remind her of Dale, sweaty and immobile, but an empty stomach never got no one nowhere. Vera's got her little girl to find. Well now, a voice cajoles its owner stationed on a stool. What's a pretty young thing like you doing here? 
Vera sets her pack on the black square of a checkerboard floor. She dredges up a smile, flicks her hair. It's dirty blonde in sunshine. Neon green, red, and the <laughs> red and green in the neon blaze of open light, live music, cores. <coughs> but under the fluorescence, it's delicate and pearled. She feels the man's gaze run loose over her ringless fingers, slide down the hips she's sewn up in overalls. They are deep set, his eyes, and dark as oil wells. His jacket says O'Reilly and yellow embroidery. He buys her scrambled eggs and sausage links. Mind if I ask something, says Vera, after wolfing down her food. She leans into the sooty breath of her breakfast sponsor, smiling sweet as apple pie. This man is hoping to show her the inside of his truck to press her face against its vinyl seats as if that's all she ever wanted to see. Tell me, she says, taking a final swig of coffee, swishing the bitterness around her mouth. What's an ugly old thing like you doing here? <laughs> the diner door clangs closed on answers, its jingle-lingle laughing, and Vera squints into sunshine, a town called Hellswell. Home of the Copper Camp Mine, reads a sign, paint, scabbed and peeling. The place is ghosted, stupefied by heat. Vera has run out of missing person flyers to post, so she finds a bulletin board, flips over a gun show poster, and scrawls out a description of Amy Lee. Six years old, brown eyes, a loose tooth, likes bubbles and horses. She writes Dale's phone number at the bottom. It's the only one she can think of besides the police, and they can't do anything now. They told her that themselves, stooped inside Dale's trailer and taken off their hats, tugged them on when they left. Ain't that something, thinks Vera, fanning her face with her own hat. A wide brim straw number smelling faintly of the maple syrup pooled on diner countertops. She's hungry again, but there's so much ground to cover, a whole planet of red, gritty ground. Ain't that something, walking in and out of someone else's life? I'm just gonna take a drink. <laughs> Carlos, Cosmos, Rockingham Pete, knows a thing or two about women. He knows their mouths make red O's when putting on lipstick. He knows they carry secrets like spare change. He knows enough that when he sees a grimy blonde teetering towards Cosmos treasures and trash, the junk shop that doubles as his home, that she'll be staying the night. It won't be in his bed, though. Hot damnation. <laughs> I got a room, he declares, before she's even at his door. She nods and he reckons they already get along. They both know talking isn't the only way of speaking. Carlos Pete is a spiritual man, though he'd never admit it. He's always believed that when fate pulls strings, it ain't wise to pull back. You've got to take what comes, same as you've got to give what's taken away. First door on the left, he tells her, pointing up the stairs. Shake out the blankets in case critters got in. It's just that normally Carlos Pete gives drifters a bit of bread and directions to the train yard. Was this a sign of mental decline, him welcoming strangers? His store hasn't pulled a profit in four months. In fact, there hasn't been a customer all day. What's more, he already has a lodger taken in last week, a soft-spoken, shiny-eyed California who'd called himself Smithson. At least that kid had made a pledge to do some chores. This woman, though. You want a drink? 
He hollers in the direction of her room. She answers with the box spring creak of a body on a mattress. I'm a damn fool, he thinks, a fat old sucker. The woman had been looking over her shoulder like she had the devil behind her. Maybe she did, for all he knows, what devil wouldn't want to chase a thing like her? Blue-eyed, with bare shoulders budding from overall straps, a pair of playboy tits. And it's been so long since Carlos Pete had something pretty to look at. Even if her pretty is buried beneath an inch of grit, even if he's likely three times her age, he certainly can't look at himself, paunched belly, skid mark skin, ponytail gone gray, mirrors show his house another stranger. He hauls himself up to her room and peers inside. She's fallen asleep with her boots still on. It's not yet six o'clock. Must have been damn tired, thinks Carlos Pete. He rubs his neck, stiff with a tiredness you can't sleep off. When Vera dreams, she dreams of Amy Lee as a silky-winged bird. She imagines herself back at Dale, her daughter overhead, her daughter circling the white grid of mobile homes, too joyful to drop down. Vera last saw her daughter at the Mission Hill playground. Her daughter flitting in and out of the jungle gym like a wild bird, a giddy green hummer, a grinning goldfinch, a trogan blood-bellied and singing. Vera had sat watching on a park bench, resting from her shift at the auto parts warehouse. A dizzy kind of work, an echoing reshuffle that cracked her hand and frayed her mind. She'd closed her eyes for a moment, at least it felt like a moment, and pictured Amy Lee soaring into the air, finding wings. When she opened them, her daughter was gone. At first, Vera thought Amy Lee really had flown off. She'd been happy in that instant, peaceful even, believing her daughter had escaped to something better, believing at least her little girl was free. Carlos Pete stays up all night, thinking the kinds of thoughts he hasn't in years. Big thoughts, terrible thoughts, heavy-footed thoughts that stomp across his mind. There's a woman in the house. The first time in years, she's a live wire, a tripped switch. Carlos Pete feels the walls rise around him, blood bolt through his veins. Smithson! He calls, and his boy guest emerges grinning from the cellar, cheek stirt smudged, spark bug in hand. The kid is 17, a runaway, no doubt, just as Carlos Pete had once been. Not that the kid knows. The kid doesn't know much about anything besides the wiry entrails of electronics. Carlos Pete has kept quiet out of habit, but all of a sudden he feels his words shake loose. He sees them tumble into sight. Way back, before the years piled up, Carlos Pete was one heck of a lady lover. He was a Casanova, a virtuoso, a phenomenon. He had cheekbones like flying buttresses and strong arms that swung the pretty girls of Hellswell round in circles. His mama sighted an ancestry threading through the Anasazi, winding among Spanish conquistadors, wayward Franciscans, homeless homesteaders, and a whole contingent of bright-eyed prospectors. His blood was a cocktail of passion. Women got drunk just looking in his eyes. Was it really such a surprise with blood like that when his feet got itchy? He split town for a post in the Navy at age 23, he left his mama's house and all the pretty girls weeping behind. It was in the sea, in the warm sweep of the Corocio current, the spray shivering up off a storm surge that Carlos Pete found his heart's match. The ocean left him love-struck in a way no woman ever had. Not that he didn't meet more women as well. He met flamenco dancers, yam pickers, Danish princesses, spice merchantesses, actresses disguised as men. 
He never said no to any of them, but he never quite said yes either, even after quitting the service somewhere near Singapore. The water always lured him back. For his mama, Carlos Pete mailed home the glittering oddities of the world. Boxes full of ostrich feathers, teacups carved from narwhal horns, pressed hibiscus from Hawaii. Once he sent a chip off a Greenland glacier cut to sparkle like a huge diamond. She'd open an empty crate he knew, save for one damp breath of the borealis, spectral and sublime. The gifts were the best kind of restitution he could manage for his absence. All told, for 20 years, Carlos Pete washed up on palm shorelines and into thronged seaports, then later left on the tides. He spun round in cyclones, drifted through the dark net of latitudes, longitudes, and never got caught. Then one day a letter found him, pronouncing his mama dead. Carlos Pete arrived at his boyhood home with plans to sell the place quick. As sole inheritor, he figured he'd spend his earnings on a sailboat. There seemed no reason to stick around. All the pretty girls he'd known in Hellswell weren't girls anymore. They weren't so pretty either. But the house wouldn't sell. It watched the highway like an old dog from sunup to sundown, too whipped to move. A curious property, sure, Carlos Pete's grandfather built it from the tornado-fied remnants of an old mining town but not the kind of place most people want to start a life, and as sure as heck wasn't where Carlos Pete wanted to finish his. Trouble was, even if he had the funds, the house was gorged with belongings, generations of them, cupboards swelled with pickaxes, cake pans, a lifetime subscription to Reader's Digest, and everything Carlos Pete had ever mailed to his mother, every jeweled teapot or furred Russian hat, sulked throughout the house like a writ of Hades corpus. I'm going to pause that story there. I promise the rest of it is really good. <laughs> I'm going to read one really short story to close. Thank you again for coming. And this story is called Acid. You'll say it was because your parents didn't understand you. That's why you left. But really, it's because they understood you too well. They looked at you, their daughter, the way they read labels in the grocery store. All the ingredients adding up. They watched you with faint, serious joy playing across their faces. Sally Sunshine, people call you now the other hippies and runaways and spirit seekers. Sally, sunny sunshine, they say, because you hardly ever stay inside. You sit in the sun until your fair skin burns, the heat branding your shoulders, your cheeks nipples when you go topless, burning until the skin blisters and peels. The skin, it lifts off the surface of your arms like a pale, thin rust. Sally, Sally Sunshine, the others sing, what are you going to do today? How good it feels to be misunderstood, to be looked at as something unknowable. You do things to keep them guessing. You do things to keep yourself guessing. You're so young, says one of the men, another sour, smelling, matted-haired man. You grab his crotch and look him straight in the eyes and laugh. The house belongs to an old artist. He has a long beard and skin like a raisin, and sometimes he disappears into the desert and then comes back and makes tea and sits on the porch, still staring into the desert. You aren't sure he even realizes everyone else is there. You are a queen. Your hair is loose and ropey, your skin burned. You wear a long dress and let it drag behind you. 
You walk barefoot everywhere. You step on burrs in coyote shit, on nails. You don't care. That is part of your mystery, how little you care. You are an animal. You burrow into pillows. You speak only in howls. You are a pure thing. You do what you want. You do not help clean. You do not help cook. You won't say sorry. Sometimes the others talk about ideals. Freedom, equality, peace. You like the sound of the words. You like that you can put the words in your pocket, let them jangle alongside raven feathers, an old penny, a bullet casing, things that seem both precious and worthless. Categorical, says the old man, the artist rocking on the porch. He looks out in the desert. He looks and looks and looks. There are the mountains, naked, scrubbed to brown, everything naked, too hot for anything else. And the smoke, the sweat smells, candle burning, bare feet, ringing bells. Even now it's in your brain, your parents' words like acid worming inside you. Sally, they used to say, our brave little girl, our smart little girl, you're going to do big things, you're going to do important things. And how it pains you remembering this, how it makes you writhe and dance Press your fingers into the sharp ends of swaro spines, thinking, knowing that they still might be right. That's it. Thank you.